crap. I wrenched the steering wheel over to the right, causing the tires to scream in protest. A deep horn blared loudly, almost rupturing my eardrums, and the interior was momentarily illuminated by harsh white headlights. For a split second, my life flashed in front of my eyes and then I felt the bumpiness of the grassy edge of the road jostle me around. The 18-wheeler which had veered into my lane missed me by less than a foot, blasting by in a blur at what had been 70 miles an hour or more. After a split second of catching my breath, I jabbed the driver's window switch down and stuck my head out into the pouring rain. Idiot! I screamed at the retreating logging truck, though I knew the driver wouldn't be able to hear me. A moment later, an outraged woman's voice had tumbled from the speakers of my rented Chrysler 300. I beg your pardon. Regaining my senses and remembering that I had been in the middle of a phone call, I sat back down in my seat. Not you, Aaron, I said apologetically. If you didn't hear the commotion on my end of the line, I almost got splattered all over the front end of some moron's Peterbilt who wandered over to my side of the road. There was a moment of silence from the speakers and then my agent let out a small snort. Well, isn't that just grand? You gotta love idiots on the roads these days. It took a softer tone. I'm glad you didn't get into an accident, Al. I don't feel like losing my best client and close friend in one go. I laughed. Helps me relax to know that you care. I admitted then, after a moment getting the tension out of my muscles, I pulled the car back onto the road and continued on. It was the winter of 2022 and I was on my way to a book signing in Seattle from where I lived in Gold Beach, Oregon. I was a writer who had just broken the New York Times bestseller list with my debut novel and as such, I was in the start of my book signing tour which would take me around the country. Obviously, as many people would quickly realize who I am if I used my real name, I have changed it along with others. Aaron, my literary agent, had suggested that I fly to Seattle from the airport in North Bend. But I'm someone who's had a major anxiety over flying ever since the September 11th attack in 2001. So instead, knowing that I hadn't purchased a new car to replace my rather shabby and broken down one yet, she had arranged me a rental, and I had begun the almost seven and a half hour drive north. I wouldn't have had to deal with those dingbats if Interstate 5 hadn't jammed up with that accident, I muttered. Well, you were the one who wanted to drive, Al. Aaron's chiding voice came through the speakers. Do you have any idea where you are? I glanced at the GPS map for what had to have been the hundredth time. The screen almost seemed to glitch, jumping as the antenna on the top of my car attempted to communicate with an orbiting satellite above. Piece of crap. No, this stupid navigation system is apparently on the fritz, I snorted. So much for Enterprise being a good car rental company. I looked back just in time to see a sign with the gas symbol flash past. Thank God for small favors, I thought. Hey, there's a gas station coming up soon. I'm a bit low anyway, so I'll stop there, get directions, and then I'll call you when I'm on my way, okay? There was a sigh on the speakers. Okay, just please try not to be too long. The publishing house won't like it if you show up to your very first book signing late tomorrow, she said. I'll be as quick as I can, I said reassuringly and then pressed the red disconnect button on the steering wheel, ending the call. I let out a sigh of relief. Aaron was my saving grace and had been the one to orchestrate my contract, including a very nice advance, but after a while, it became exhausting to deal with her. I stared out at the windshield at the two-lane road in front of me, relishing in the silence, save for the rain pelting the car's windshield. The windshield wipers flicking it off and the tires on the wet pavement. For a few more minutes, all I saw was nothing but endless trees pushing in close to the road, almost seeming as if they were jostling to see who drove up and down past them. 
then almost as if my thoughts had summoned it. I saw the bright lights appear ahead on the right like a lighthouse begin. It was clearly one which had been here a very long time. The overall appearance gave the impression that it had been around since at least the 1950s, if not earlier. I grunted with surprise as I saw the light-up station logo swinging around in a lazy circle on its pole. The faded green outline of a brontosaurus and similarly weathered red letters spelling out Sinclair were once I thought that I would never see in person, seeing as how the company had gone defunct back in March. I guess nobody told the owner of this one that. I pulled into the station, my tires driving over a small black wire which had caused a classic bell to ding loudly twice, somewhere out of sight. Pulling up next to the green pump, I shut the engine off and relaxed back into the comfortable leather listening to the tick of the engine cooling down. As I closed my eyes, I could only hear the loud buzz of the fluorescent lights overhead and the rain pelting the metal awning over the palms. I opened my eyes as I heard the rain peter out and I looked around, glancing at the analog clock on the dash illuminated by the overhead lights. 7.30 p.m. Ten minutes had passed. I sighed. Come on, man, I muttered and then quickly tapped the horn. The blaring sound of it almost seemed to shatter the stillness like a baseball through a plate glass window. Still nobody. Dang it, I whispered, and then I unbuckled my seatbelt and I pulled on the handle, using my foot to kick open the door. A bitingly cold wind smashed into my face as I stepped out onto the cracked concrete causing me to flip up the collar of my coat in response. I glanced around, only hearing the sounds of the wind whipping through the trees, crickets chirping, and what had to be the hoots of an owl somewhere off in the forest beyond. The garage bays were open, and in the faded yellow light of what had to be an old incandescent bulb, I could see what looked like a 50s Cadillac and a 70s International Scout up on the lifts but no mechanic in sight. And leaning back into the car, I leaned on the horn longer this time. Again, the sound reverberated off the trees and station. For some reason, I shivered at the noise. It almost feels sacrilegious to disturb the silence out here. I shook my head. Where the heck had that thought come from? I shook it away and waited another minute or so. There was still no sign of life. Maybe the station is actually closed. The thought was worrying. I hadn't seen another sign of civilization, aside from that idiot logging truck in two and a half hours. I didn't know how far it was until the next town or gas station, and as good as the Chrysler had been on gas, I didn't want to try driving further on only a quarter tank. I decided to find out for myself slamming the driver's door closed with a loud thunk. Stepping around the front of the car, I walked across to the open bays, the sound of my footfalls echoing back at me. I glanced around, noticing the spilled oil on the ground and the mismatched tools, bottles, and hoses heaved unceremoniously on the bench in the back. But still, I saw no one. Great, I thought looking up to see the bright moon begin to appear from behind the clouds. I had begun to turn and stride towards what had to be an office or a convenience store when the figure burst out of the door, nearly causing me to jump out of my skin. Gah! I involuntarily let out, receiving a good-natured laugh in return. I'm sorry, sir, I didn't mean to startle you, let alone make you wait so long. I caught my breath and then let out a strained chuckle and looked up at the man. He appeared to be in his late 40s or early 50s, dressed in a green Sinclair jumpsuit adorned with the same green dinosaur in the front patch. The patch on the other side proclaimed the man's name to be Harold. The remaining hair in his head was slicked back, and he flashed me a smile with surprisingly bright white teeth. I held up my hand, giving it a little wobble and gave a laugh of relief. Don't worry about it, man. 
For a second, I thought this place was permanently closed or something. I said, the steadiness returning to my voice. No, sir, just the fact it's only little old me at work in the night shifts. He declared, jokingly wiping his brow. I snorted and smiled. The man clearly had a decent sense of humor. I'm guessing you need gas, he asked, changing the subject to business and gesturing to my car. I nodded. Yes, please, if you could fill her up with regular. He nodded and then began towards it as I jogged back around, opening the driver's door and pressing the button to pop the gas cap. Harold let out a low whistle as he pulled the pump from its cradle. Very nice car, sir, he exclaimed, looking it over. It looks expensive. I shrugged my shoulders. It is a nice car, a Chrysler 300S, but unfortunately it's not mine. He looked up at me and cocked an eyebrow as he slid the nozzle in and pulled on the handle. It's a rental, I added quickly, realizing it sounded like I had jacked it or something. He seemed to relax. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, he said jovially. It's nicer and newer than anything we normally see out here usually. I jerked my thumb at the open bays. I would say you have people with good taste around here, seeing as how that's a 55 coupe de ville back there, I said. He laughed, nodding approvingly. I see you know your cars, he said with an impressed tone, glancing at the readout on the pump. I do love them, I replied. He looked back up at me. So, are you some kind of auto collector, a race car driver then? He asked. I shook my head. No, afraid not. I'm a writer. He jerked his head up, his green eyes seeming to twinkle in the fluorescent lights. A writer? Well, blow me down. I never thought I would get a god-honest writer in my station. He exclaimed, smiling. I nodded, feeling a slight sense of uncomfortableness wash over me. I still hadn't gotten used to the reaction people had when they learned of my profession. He pressed forward. What kind of books do you write? He asked excitedly. I write in the horror genre, honestly, I admitted, causing him to smile wildly at the news. Hey, horror is my favorite style of books to read, he said. I love everything from the old classics to Stephen King. He looked at me quizzically. How many have you written so far? I held up a single finger. Just one published. I'm actually on the way to a publicity signing right now. He nodded approvingly, and then looked back at the pump before speaking again. So, have you ever seen anything truly scary? I raised an eyebrow at his question. That came completely out of left field. What do you mean by that? I asked in return. He still watched the pumps but replied. So many horror writers that I've heard talk about how they've had their own frightening experience, whether it's a plain old scare or even a supernatural experience. It's what helps them write truly horrifying tales. Now he looked back at me. His face held a smile which caused me to inwardly shudder a little bit. It almost seemed far too wide for a moment. Then blinking, I realized it was just a regular grin, if not just a bit of an odd one. The lights must have caused you to see things. He finished. So, I was just asking if you've ever had a scary experience which got you into writing horror. For a moment, there was a silence between us as I pondered his question, only broken by an owl's screech somewhere in the gathering darkness. Then I shrugged. Honestly, I, I hate to disappoint you, but no, I admitted he gave me a slightly surprised expression. Really? I nodded, deciding to be honest with him. Really? And to be completely truthful with you, Harold, as much as I love horror, both writing it and reading and watching it, I've stopped being scared of it a while ago. The surprised expression seemed to grow on his face. Really? He repeated and then looked down at the pump again. That's a shame, he said his voice almost holding a trace of sadness in it. I nodded, having to agree with him. It is, I used to love getting scared by a good horror film or a book. But as I got older, it just seemed to, you know, drift away. Now I just write what I know others are afraid of. 
like I did with my first book here, but honestly, when I write, I don't feel that fear in me at all. I hated admitting it, even when I had given my first online interview with a magazine about my novel. I had lied about it, saying that my own work could scare the heck out of me. But in a way, it felt good to finally admit the truth to someone, even just a stranger that I would likely never see again. I looked up to find him, giving me a rather intense and honestly extremely creepy stare. His green eyes almost seemed to glow in the lights and his smile had completely disappeared. I took a step back at the abrupt change in his demeanor, but just as quickly it too was wiped away, replaced by the smile that I had known since he appeared. Well, I'm sure if you search hard enough, you'll find that feeling again, he said, his voice filled with what sounded like genuine empathy. I nodded, looking out at the woods. I hope, I truthfully admitted, and then heard the sound of the pump finally clicking off. Ah, all done, Harold said happily, pulling the pump out of the car and replacing it back in its cradle. He looked at the readout. That'll be 2317. I started slightly. Under 24 bucks for three quarters of a tank. I haven't heard of gas this cheap since I was at least a teenager, but at the same time, I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I reached into my back pocket to pull in out my wallet and from it, my credit card. Uh, do you happen to accept credit? I asked, half afraid that he would tell me he didn't. But he plucked the card happily out of my hand. Of course we do, Mr. He looked down the name on my card. Mr. Damascus. The credit card reader, however, is back inside the main building. He gestured back towards the door that he had exited from. Would you mind if I took it back there and ran it? I shook my head. No, by all means, go right ahead, I said. And he turned away and strode back across towards the building. Now I'll be right back out with your receipt, quicker than you can say. Bob's your uncle, he called. I let out another laugh at the phrase that I hadn't heard in years when I noticed something. I hadn't seen the man's back since he had appeared and this was my first time. The back of his jumpsuit was the same stained green as the front with a red oil rag peeking out of the back pocket. But my eyes were drawn to one thing. What looked like a large tear in it, just below the large logo patch adorning the back, almost as if he had been slashed. I could see an equally stained white shirt underneath it. Uh, hey, I called out to him. He stopped and turned back to me, still smiling. Yes, he asked. I pointed to my own back. Your, uh, your jumpsuit has a huge tear in the back of it. Just wanted to tell you in case you didn't know. For a moment, the same funny look came over his face and then he waved his hand dismissively. Oh, I know. I haven't had a chance to mend it yet. He said and then holding up a finger pulled open the door, causing a bell hung from the inside handle to jing, and he stepped inside. I was left alone again with only the buzzing sound of the lights almost causing my ears to ring in the sudden silence. Not wanting to seem rude by waiting back in the car, I instead walked to the front and leaned against the hood, staring out into the night. My eyes absentmindedly drifted off into the gloom as I waited for Harold to return. That's when my eyes finally glanced over at the large sign directly ahead of me. It was the one which advertised the price for gas by the gallon. And as I had pulled in from the other way, not to mention getting too caught up talking, I hadn't even looked at it. You could easily tell that it had fallen into a bit of disrepair, as the light inside which allowed you to see the prices at night flickered on and off, precariously seeming as though it would burn out at any second. You could even hear it flickering loudly in the silence. That wasn't what drew my eye though. No, what drew my eye was the prices displayed on the flickering sign. There's absolutely no freaking way, I whispered to myself. I scanned down but kept looking at the top two figures. 88 cents a gallon for regular. I felt a small wave of confusion fall over me. No matter how out in the middle of nowhere the station was, there was no way that it would charge that little for gas. Not to mention, 
It showed prices for both unleaded and leaded gasoline, something that had been banned since at least the mid-90s. As my mind attempted to process this, something else fully sunk in. The entire forest around the station had fallen silent. And I'm not talking a normal silence either. The crickets, the owl, the rustling of what I thought were deer or elk in the trees had vanished. Even the wind had seemed to stop. It was an almost unearthly stillness, as if the entire forest were holding its breath. It was beyond unnerving and eerie to say the least and it caused a shiver to shoot up my spine. And the only sound that I could hear was the almost maddeningly loud buzz of the overhead lights, which seemed to drone like that of a growling creature. I realized every muscle in my body had tensed up though I couldn't understand why. Sure, the silence is eerie, but it's nothing to be afraid of, I thought. As much as I repeated that thought to myself, I couldn't help but feel increasingly on edge in the stillness. Okay, screw this. I said finally the sound of even my own echoing voice sounding just off to me. Pushing myself off my hood and beginning for the door that Harold had gone through. As I walked, I looked at the watch in my wrist, seeing another 15 minutes had passed since he had left. Where is he? Letting out a sigh, both of frustration and to try and relieve some of the odd sensation forming in my gut, I finally reached the door and reached out, gripping the handle. It felt almost shockingly cold in my hand and I quickly twisted it, opening the door and causing the bell to jingle, sounding too loud in the quiet. I stepped inside and allowed it to swing shut behind me, the bell giving another jingle, this time muted in the building's interior. I looked around, aside from an old Coca-Cola machine in one corner of the room, there were no food or drinks in here. Instead, the two or three aisles taking up most of the space were filled with what looked like older style cans of motor oil and other assorted automotive bits and bobs, all adorned with the dinosaur logo. I drew in a breath and then I coughed a little. It felt more than a little musty in here as if it hadn't been aired out in a long time. Looking directly ahead, I saw the counter that Harold must usually be stationed at. An older style cash register sat atop it, and behind it lay an open door marked employees only. Beyond was a long tiled hallway which stretched out for a while before disappearing around the corner. I stared at the cash register. I haven't seen one of these old jobs since I was a kid in the 90s. I thought a few nostalgic emotions breaking through my other emotions and tugging at my heartstrings, but it just as quickly shooed away by the uneasy feeling that was settling over me like a cloud of dust. This whole thing, this whole place just seemed wrong. I couldn't tell why, but it was making my arms and legs feel as though insects were inching along under my skin. After a moment's hesitation, I opened my mouth. Uh, hey, Harold, I called. My voice seemed muted, just like the bell had. I waited. No answer. Hey, Harold, are you back there? I called again. Still nothing. The feeling increased in the on edge as the fluorescent lights in here sounded like they were also buzzing too loud. I craned my neck to look down the corridor. Just barely at the corner, I saw the bright blue sign indicating the restroom. I made my decision, calling out again. Look, if you can hear me, Harold, I'm coming over to the counter to use the restroom, okay? I can't hold it until I get to the next town. That was a lie. I hadn't eaten or drank anything in the last two hours to make me have to go. But just in case he came around the corner, I didn't want to get into trouble as odd as I felt. I still didn't want to piss the man off. Taking a deep breath, I hopped the counter and stepped into the corridor. Unlike the main room, this was lit by three or four incandescent light bulbs dangling down from the ceiling. It gave the hall a slightly dimmer look than behind me, and I hesitated for a moment before starting down it, taking care not to have my footsteps echo too much. The hall seemed to go on forever, but eventually, I reached the corner. 
Wanting to keep up appearances, I turned the knob for the bathroom and opened it. After looking in for a split second, I shut it quickly, suppressing a cough and a gag. It had looked disgusting as though it hadn't been cleaned in years, if not decades. Turning back, I noticed a brighter light down at the end of the next stretch of hallway. I debated for a moment and then I began down it. All I wanted was to be out of here. I passed another open door, glancing through it. I saw the two garage bays and the view outside. The blast of cold, fresh air relieved me somewhat and I continued on. As I reached the doorway, I looked around, seeing that it was an office. Two desks stood inside, each with nameplates on the edge of them. I spied Harold's name on the far one. I also saw my credit card sitting in the middle of the table. The bright blue stood out amongst the dark wood and the white papers. Letting out a relieved sigh, I crossed to it quickly and picked it up. I decided that I would leave a 20 and 10 in cash on the desk and said and just get the heck out of here. I didn't know where the man had gone to and every fiber of my being was telling me to leave. As I reached for my wallet, my eyes caught a plaque on the wall behind the desk. The faux gold glinting in on the low light. I stared at it. The photograph was clearly Harold's, looking almost the same as I had seen him, just a lot cleaner. But all that was a declaration etched into the fake gold. Employee of the Month, Harold Janikowski. I couldn't help but smile a little at how hard he must have worked for it. Less than a second later though, the smile dropped from my face as I read the inscription underneath it. August 1976. I shook my head, hoping that I was just seeing things in the low light hoping that it would change to 2006, or heck, even 1996. But no, it remained the same. What the... I breathed out, feeling another shiver go down my spine. There was absolutely no way that, if he had looked to be in his 40s or 50s in the mid-70s, that he would still look the same 46 years later. He would at least be in his 80s or 90s now, and would very much not still be working here. What is going on? I whispered again, feeling like tendrils of dread were reaching out of the gloom and jamming themselves in me. I turned to book it out of the room and out of the station entirely. But I froze as I saw Harold. He sat in an old-style black swivel chair, his back to me in the next room. I couldn't tell what the room was, as it was lit only by a single, very dim bulb directly over him but the room was giving me off truly creepy vibes. For the first time in years, I felt the first inklings of fear. Before I had a chance to move or say anything, he spoke. Well, Mr. Damascus, he said, his voice almost inflectionless. I began to speak. Look, I'm sorry that I barged back in here, it's just... I was cut off as he continued. Well, Mr. Damascus, how do you feel... My shoulders thumped as I felt a wave of confusion envelop me. Excuse me? I managed out. How do you feel? He repeated and then continued, his voice finally seeming to gain some cadence to it. Do you feel afraid? Do you feel fear? He let out a low chuckle, one that almost seemed different from the happy one that I had heard outside. I didn't know how to respond. Finally, he spoke again. It's okay, you don't have to tell me. I know, I can feel it. He let out another chuckle and I felt multiple shivers shoot up my spine. And frankly, Mr. Damascus, I'm happy about that. He said, standing up but still keeping his back to me. Because you all taste so much better when you're afraid. This time, I did manage to say something. The heck? It wasn't the most eloquent response, but apparently Harold had found it funny, as he let out another low, creepy chuckle. He finally turned towards me and I jumped backwards, slamming into his desk and causing his nameplate to fall to the ground. The man still smiled at me, his smile now holding a very definitive wideness to it, holding an almost pants-wetting wickedness in it. But he didn't seem alive. His previously sparkling green eyes now seemed glassy and unseen. 
To put it bluntly, he almost more resembled a ventriloquist dummy, a puppet than anything. He almost seemed to lean towards me, and finally he spoke. I'll make it sporting though. You have 20 seconds to run, he said. Swallowing hard, I looked around and saw a tire iron on his desk. I snatched it up, ready to club the man over the head if he made a move towards me. That's when he simply dropped forward onto his face. He fell halfway forward into the room and didn't move. I looked down at him and gasped as I realized what I was seeing. The man looked like nothing more than a deflated beach ball, as though all the organs and blood in him had been sucked out. I saw the tear in the back of his jumpsuit again, this time much more pronounced. Behind it is a dirty white shirt had been torn as well, and it revealed a hole in his actual back. I could see the white of his spine clearly visible in the yellow light. As I stared down at him, I heard a voice. This one, though, was not Harold's. It seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once, much lower than I had ever heard a human voice speak, and it alone almost made me piss myself because it held a truly evil, a sadistic tone to it. 20, 19, 18, 17. I looked up and into the darkened room Harold had fallen out of, and finally for the first time in years, I screamed. Hovering just in the darkness beyond the edge of the dim light's gaze were two enormous, glowing green eyes. They were larger than a human's eyes ever could be, and in a very inhuman shape, looking like crescent moons. They held the most evil, sadistic glee that I had ever seen in my life. At my scream, the voice stopped counting down and it laughed. A great booming laugh that sounded like nails on a chalkboard. And then it began counting down again, the malicious excitement in it audible. 16, 15, 14... I didn't wait any longer. I didn't want to see what those eyes belonged to. I turned and sprinted out of the office, running down the corridor, my footfalls and panicked breathing echoing back to me like a gunshot. The corridor seemed to go on forever, and I couldn't understand why it was taking so long to reach the corner. Finally, though, I reached it and froze. I was back at the entrance to the office. What the... Behind me, I heard the voice reach 10 and I began sprinting again down the hallway. It seemed to take even longer to reach the corner and this time, I reached down to grab the corner edge, only to grab the wooded edge of the office door. My eyes widened and I felt tears begin to fall from my eyes as I ran again. The voice continued as I dashed down the ever-increasing corridor. Seven, six, five... I let out a strangled sob as I grabbed for the tiled corner, pushing off the edge of the corridor to snatch at it. Instead, I smashed into the wall next to the office door. I fell in a heap, trying to force myself up when I heard it finished. Three, two, one. Ready or not, Mr. Damascus, here I come. As it finished uttering the last word, the voice dropped even lower as if I were hearing the voice of the devil himself speak to me. I realized if I looked behind me now that I would see it. Standing in the middle of the office over its human puppet, I refused to look back. I knew that it wanted me to. Tears flowed freely down my cheeks, mixing with the blood from my head where I had slammed into the wall. Every horror movie, death in movies and books flashed through my mind and I knew all of them weren't even remotely as horrible as what that thing had planned for me. That's when I thought just a tiny glimmer of hope flashed through my mind, something that I had seen as I had walked down the hall to the office. I felt adrenaline coursing through me. I might die trying to do this, but I have to try, I thought. I heard the floor behind me rattle and I felt hot, stinking breath fall across the back of my neck. For a microsecond, I felt paralyzed with fear, and then I let out a strangled cry exploding into motion. I heard a bellow of frustration behind me, followed by a laugh. It knew once I had reached the end of the corridor, it would use whatever power it had to bring me right back next to it. It had power over this corridor, 
but it doesn't realize that it left a weak spot open. The thought still echoing in my mind, I ran, unable to keep myself from screaming this time as I dashed down the corridor. It seemed even longer than before, but as I reached the halfway point, I saw what I had been hoping to spy. The door into the garage stood open, almost hidden out of sight beyond a shelf of oil. I let out another cry, this one of determination. Behind me, I heard the creature stop laughing. Now it let out a bellowing cry of rage, realizing what I intended to do. I felt it begin to thunder up the corridor after me to snatch me up, the feeling of something sharp sliced across my back. And then I was leaping for the doorway and through it. I landed in a puddle of still sticky oil underneath the Cadillac. What I saw now was rusting away with decades of disrepair. Not wasting a second, I jumped to my feet and ran for the open bay doors. Behind me, I heard a louder bellow, but I didn't look back. I burst out from inside the doors into the night, now laden with the sounds of the forest again. I dashed for my car, almost flying over the hood and ripped open the driver's door. Crashing into the seat, I stabbed at the start button. For a moment terrified that like the typical horror cliche that wouldn't start, but to my surprise and gratitude, it did. The roar of the V6 thundering out. As I grabbed the knob to jam into drive, I risked one glance up, and I couldn't help but scream out again. The entire gas station had gone dark. The inside, the overhead lights, everything. I could see the outline of the building, but that was it. And the eyes. The eyes glowed at me from inside the base with absolute rage and hatred. Still screaming and staring at them, I slammed my foot down onto the accelerator. The tires screamed and the car shot forward like a rocket, tearing out from under the awning and out onto the road. I refused to look in the rearview mirror. I knew that I would see those eyes one final time in them and I didn't want to. I just kept my eyes on the road in front of me. As far as my headlights reached, my knuckles white as I gripped the wheel and roared away from that place behind me. I just about never let up my foot from that gas pedal, taking the corners far too fast. Not until the warm lights of the next town finally came into view, one that I can't recall the name of. I felt myself beginning to cry, this time tears of happiness and relief. I drove straight through to the police station. I knew that I could never tell them what had actually happened to me. They would think that I was utterly insane or on something. But I could tell them that I had been attacked by a crazed lunatic at an old gas station. And that's exactly what I did. I burst in, begging to speak to someone. The officers at the desk calmed me down and took my statement, taking it all very seriously when I showed them my back, which, as it turned out, had three deep slashes in it. But when I told them where it happened, confused looks came over both their faces. As a paramedic rushed in from outside to check my wounds, one of the officers walked into the back, returning with the sergeant on duty, an older gentleman in the 60s. Please tell me again what happened to you, he had asked gently. I did, and when I finished, he shook his head. Son, it couldn't have possibly have happened at the Sinclair station 10 or 12 miles back, he said softly. I stammered. Why not? I demanded, struggling for my words. Because, he began, it closed in 1979 after a huge fire had gutted it, killing everybody inside. It's been almost a half a year since that incident now. I never made my book signing, which earned me a furious phone call from Erin. Her fury disappeared when she heard that I had been attacked. I told her that it had been from someone that I had pulled over attempting to help on the side of the road. I didn't want to repeat the same conversation that I had had with the police. They said they would try and find whoever had attacked me, but I know they never will. Not after they showed me a newspaper article, yellowed with age, showing the burned out hulk of the gas station that I had been to. Along with a very familiar photograph of a smiling man next to it. I still am a horror writer, 
The horror that I saw that night it didn't stop me from writing. My second novel is due out this year. But now whenever I sit down on my computer and begin to write a truly scary scene, I feel the chills of fear from my own creation that jolt up my spine. Because I know true horrors lie in this world. And I hope I never come across them again. I'm posting this here not only to tell the truth finally about what I experienced, but also as a warning to anyone who will listen. If you're ever in the Pacific Northwest on a lonely two-lane road in the middle of nowhere, and you happen to come across an old-looking gas station lit up with a green Brontosaurus logo spinning in the night, just keep your foot hard down and keep going, because you may not be as lucky as I was.